Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily ruling. Today is this month's patron pick, and as always, it's a really interesting topic. To set the stage, here's a fun magic trivia question for you. Which game zone is referenced on the fewest number of magic cards? The answer may surprise you. Well, probably not if you looked at the title of the video, but I do think it is a bit surprising that there are literally more cards out there that reference the anti-zone than the stack. The most famous stack card isn't even referring to the game zone. I think it's weird how little the card designers seem to reference the stack in-game, because to me, the stack is more or less an essential part of Magic's identity as a card game, and playing a card in response is a core part of what makes up Magic gameplay to me. But that reluctance might explain why this is such a difficult concept for many newcomers. So let's take a look at exactly how the stack works and how it interacts with some other Magic concepts. Before we get too deep into the current system, I think it's a good idea to get some context by examining the problems that the stack was meant to solve. First, and most importantly, the stack needs a defined order. It should not be possible for two spells or abilities to resolve at the same time. You don't have to think too hard to come up with a situation that could lead to a paradoxical or nonsensical game state here. For example, if you played a removal spell and your opponent played a protection spell, would the creature be destroyed? If you played a creature and a mass pump spell at the same time, would your creature be getting the buff? The other important reason that we need a stack is a more technical one that has to do with when people can play spells. Some people might be surprised to hear this, but the stack was actually not part of the game when Magic was first started. Rather, it was added as part of the sweeping 6th edition rules changes. Before we had the stack, we had what were called batches. A batch worked on a first-in, last-out system, just like the stack, but unlike the stack, it was not possible to let some of the spells resolve and then play some new spell and then let the rest of the spells resolve. This necessitated the creation of a special card type, Interrupts, which would basically allow you to do exactly that for counterspells and some other types of effects, because flavorfully that was exactly how they would function. Then they had to introduce a new card type, Mana Source, for stuff that added mana to your mana pool, otherwise it would not be possible to use mana from such a spell to cast Interrupts. Eventually it was recognized that lifting the rule that people could not add spells to a batch once it started resolving solved all of those problems, and so the stack was born. So now that we know what the stack is supposed to do, let's talk a little bit about exactly how it works. The general idea is pretty straightforward. Anytime you play a spell or ability, it goes on the stack, and you can respond to a spell or ability that's already on the stack by playing one of your own, in which case the other spell or ability that was played in response will happen first. It turns out, though, that there's, well, a few complications. First of all, we have the question of what goes on the stack. A lot of players initially think that everything that happens in the game goes onto the stack, but this is not true. The fact is, only three things can ever go onto the stack. Spells, activated abilities, and triggered abilities. There's a lot of things that can happen in the game that don't fit into one of those three categories, though. And the fact that they don't means that they don't use the stack and they cannot be responded to. So let's take a look at some of those. For one, the thing that kills lethally damaged creatures is a state-based action, and state-based actions in general do not use the stack. It's not possible to respond to a lethally damaged creature dying. Once it has lethal damage on it, it's pretty much too late to do anything about it. So if you have something that can regenerate, that can save it, well, you need to do that before the creature takes lethal damage. Another example of something that does not use the stack is turn-based actions. This is stuff like untapping for your turn, drawing your card for the turn, and putting counters on your sagas. It's easy to see why this one is confusing, because a lot of the time you can do something that's very similar to responding to these actions, and the only difference is mainly a semantic one. For example, you might not be able to tap down the grizzly bears in response to declaring attackers, but you certainly could do that in the beginning of combat step, which is functionally about the same thing. The other reason that I can think that this might be confusing, especially for some older players, is that some of these turn-based actions actually did use the stack under some of Magic's older rules. The most famous example of this is combat damage, which used to go on the stack, making it possible to, for example, trade a Mog Fanatics with the Grizzly Bears by putting the Mog Fanatics damage on the stack and then activating its ability in response. Did you know that drawing a card for turn also used to be considered a triggered ability? This meant that it went on the stack and could be responded to just like any other. In fact, one of the original uses for Stifle was that it could deny your opponent their draw step. Under the current rules, neither of these tricks is possible because the relevant game events are now turn-based actions, which do not use the stack. Another thing that people tend to think uses the stack would be costs. So let's say, for example, that your opponent was going to activate the Mog Fanatic to deal one damage to you. Maybe you might want to play a removal spell against the Mog Fanatic in response in order to keep that from happening. Unfortunately, while it is true that Mog Fanatic's ability uses the stack, it's not possible to respond to its ability in this way. 
Once somebody starts to activate an ability, you cannot interrupt them until you get your turn to act, or properly, priority. Part of the process of putting Mog Fanatic's ability onto the stack is sacrificing the Mog Fanatic. By the time the other player gets a chance to respond to the ability, then the Mog Fanatic will already be sacrificed. These last couple of things that don't use the stack are probably some of the sneakiest, because both of them really, really look like they should. The first is special actions. A lot of these are very similar to casting a spell or activating an ability, but for technical reasons, they don't count as such. They count as special actions that behave, for the most part, exactly like activating an ability, but with a few exceptions. Principle among these being that they do not use the stack. This means it is not possible to respond to things like turning more face up or exiling a card to suspend it or playing a land. It's true that sometimes a special action will cause a triggered ability to trigger, which will in turn go onto the stack, but it is not possible to respond after somebody says they're playing a land, but before it actually happens. Finally, there's mana abilities. Mana abilities really actually are legitimate activated and triggered abilities. They just have a special rule that says they don't use the stack. This means it is not possible to respond to them either. So like if, for example, someone activates Nykthos' ability, you could not respond to that by killing one of their creatures in order to lower their devotion, because it's a mana ability and therefore it doesn't use the stack. Now that we've talked about some of the stuff that doesn't use the stack, how about some stuff that does? We'll start at the base level and work our way up through some more advanced ones. First, let's say that I want to play a Lightning Bolt against your Grizzly Bears. The Bolt doesn't resolve right away. Like any spell, you have the opportunity to respond to it. You know that if the bolt resolves right now, it will kill the bear. So you play a giant growth in response. Like all stacks, the stack in magic is last in, first out. So the gr giant growth is going to resolve first, making the grizzly bears a 5-5. When that bolt resolves, three damage will no longer be enough to kill the bear, so it lives. If I played the lightning bolt in response to your giant growth, then that would make those spells resolve the other way around. Thus, the bear would die because the bolt would deal lethal damage to it before the giant growth resolves. For the next scenario, let's say that Amy is playing a Dark Ritual. Does that use the stack? And the answer is yes. Mana abilities don't use the stack, but there's no such thing as a mana spell. It's true that in some previous versions of the rules, Dark Ritual was a special kind of spell that kind of did work like that, but today it's just a normal instant. That means that Dark Ritual uses the stack and resolves just like any other instant. Activating a Black Lotus, on the other hand, is a mana ability, and so there's no way to respond to that. And that's basically how the stack functions. The one last thing that I wanted to cover is what would happen if we try to get multiple things onto the stack at the same time. So let's say that someone plays a mass removal spell and it kills your Ward Eye Witch and your Youthful Scholar at the same time. Do you scry first or draw first? Well, with this, you'll have the Youthful Scholar's ability and two instances of Ward Eye Witches all trying to go on the stack at the same time. If multiple triggered abilities all want to go onto the stack at once, then each player in turn order puts their own triggered abilities onto the stack in whatever order that they want. So because you control all three triggers, you can say what order that they go onto the stack. You could draw two first and then scry one twice, or you could scry one twice and then draw two, or you could even scry one and then draw and then scry one again. Let's say for the next question that it's Amy's Ward Eye Witch and Nick's Youthful Scholar and they die at the same time. What happens then? So in that case, we go in turn order. Since it's Amy's turn, Ward Eye Witch's ability will go onto the stack. After that, Nick, the non-active player, will put his triggered ability on the stack on top. That means that when these are resolving, Nick will draw first, and then Amy will scry. How about this last one? Let's say Amy plays an Invoke Calamity. What order do the two spells go onto the stack? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward, but the rules behind it are actually pretty surprisingly interesting. See, usually when you have just one verb, then that means you do that action involved on all the things simultaneously. Of course, this won't do for this case because we cannot cast two spells at the same time. That's the whole point of the stack. So instead, Amy will do that action on each spell in a sequence in whatever order that she wants. And I think that about covers it. Hopefully that with this, you'll be confident in making rulings involving the stack and games that you're a part of. Thanks again to all of my patrons and to anyone who supports this channel in any way. But that's all I have for you today. How did you do? Join me again next time for another daily ruling, but until then, I hope you have a great day.